Hi, how are you? Great. You have done so much tremendous work, but before we get into the research that you're currently doing, why were you drawn into the field of women's health? Sure, that's a great question. Um, I think it started as actually a, a personal need. I felt as a woman and as a patient uh, of endometriosis, I felt that even though there was a lot of research going on, as a, as a patient, I couldn't get access to it. And I, I felt uh, very frustrated uh, because I felt like it was, you know, this translation from research to results into patient care and helping me manage my disease was just not happening. And so I asked myself, um, you know, what can I bring to the table as a, um, a researcher who's not a, a, a doctor, who's not a medical doctor? And I, uh, I actually thought that like technology, which is really what I focus on, I'm a computer scientist and a biomedical mm -hmm. informaticist, technology could be one piece of the puzzle to help uh, women get access to care better and access to managing their care in particular better. So then where and how does Citizen Endo come about? Because you're part of that, you're behind that. Yeah, so Citizen Endo was started in 2017. Uh, and we uh, basically had the idea, especially for endometriosis, to ask patients, uh, people with endometriosis to tell us directly what are their day-to-day -day symptoms and what are they doing about their endo in terms of self-management, in terms of treatments, etc. cetera. And, and the, the idea behind it was, um, you know, there are data sets uh, that are driving research in endo. They're very clinical in nature and surgical in nature biological, but there wasn't any data set that was getting the direct pa patient experience. Um, and we know with endometriosis that there hasn't always been this very uh, clean correlation between what we find on the surgical uh, side of things and what patients experience. So for example, you know, mm -hmm. some women might have way more pain that their endo on the surgical side might uh, seem. And so we, we thought with my students and the people in my lab and my collaborators that if we had access to the direct patient experience day to day and specifically because endo changes, you know, flares yeah. come in and out and it's a very time varying disease. So if we had this data and, and linked it to more clinical and basic science data, we could start getting better understanding about the disease. What have you learned um, and what's been surprising for you, not only as a, as a scientist or researcher, but also as, as someone who has the disease, what has surprised you with your findings? Yeah, I think for me, I'll, I'll start with, uh, from my personal standpoint, what's been surprising, I think is, is the, the, first of all, the overwhelmingly positive response of uh, patients. And, you know, we went in and, and we were very careful about explaining that this is a research study, this is not an app that's trying to exploit any data privacy or anything. We're asking for a lot of very intimate questions about yourself and your disease. Um, and, and we got so many enthusiastic participants that really, I think, made a difference in um, the quality of the data that we were able to collect. Uh, so that was, you know, that was so heartwarming and rewarding. Um, the other surprising thing that I found was, you know, I kind of had a, an inkling of it just because, you know, we, I had been talking to a lot of patients in part at endofound events and, and things like that and meeting uh, fellow patients. And we all had varying experiences. And yet there was kind of like a core set of things that are happening where we're like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what you're mm -hmm. talking about. Um, and it was, it was very obvious. I know we have about 15,000 participants. We analyze their data and, and in a way they're, you know, they very much go through the same uh, experience. And it's, you know, it's very motivating to keep thinking about how can we learn more about the disease, but also how can we, you know, go into helping them now, uh, you know, there's a kind of long-term research yeah. questions, but then there's also like we, when you see these day-to-day -day variations, you're like, is there anything we can do to help you 
get better now. Uh, and that's becoming kind of like what we're, what our focus is on right now. So when you say day-to-day -day variations, um, what would be examples of those? Yeah, um, you know, I think it's it's starting to change a little bit. A while back, endometriosis was kind of like, if you have uh, cramps during your period, uh, then maybe you have endometriosis or people with endo have cramps during their periods. And what we're finding is that um, definitely period time is a, is a difficult time for endo patients, but it's by no means the only time. Right. Uh, and in fact, even uh, people who don't menstruate for whatever reasons, um, you know, who are on an IUD or taking a, you know, a long-term pill or anything are still having very much flares uh, that are uh, systemic, in fact. And wow. so the day-to-day -day variations are interesting for us because we can capture through this uh, smartphone app uh, kind of like, you know, how long is the flare for someone? And was there any potential triggers uh, or was there any self-management strategies that kind of helped this person? And we're finding um, so far is that the all of these management strategies are very, very individualized and personalized, meaning that, um, you know, for example, um, physical activity for some people, arduous physical activity seems to be a way to get away from pain. And for others, it's making things way worse. Yeah. Um, you know, starting your pain medication, uh, even like, you know, uh, anti-inflammatory medication for some um makes a difference for others it doesn't make any difference and so um you know i think what it's hinting at us is that there are within person uh differences through time but a lot of uh you know differences across people when it comes to how they how we can find solutions to help them manage you mentioned about endo being a systematic disease and having a systematic response what exactly is that because when i hear systematic i immediately picture a human body just hot and inflamed that's yeah. that's how i always correlate endo for me it's always just like inflamed and, and hot and yeah. in pain no and i think it's it's funny you say that we you know we spend a lot of time trying to visualize our data and one of our visualization is actually the human body and yeah. and our participant tell us places where it hurts and it's like these hot spots everywhere so i yeah. i kind of agree with your metaphor i think that's <laughs> definitely um that's definitely one way by which we mean it's it's uh it's across the whole body it's really reaching you know people are having joint pain and chest pain and um you know what is driving us we or the app that we, we build does not go at these questions. But when we try to correlate these results with what we know from the literature, it's, it seems that it's very much, uh, you know, it's an inflammatory response basically. And there's, you know, inflammation is, not, is never, um, you know, circumscribed to one part of your body, but you see the effect of it throughout your body. And the other part is you don't only see it through pain, but, you know, things like bloating and, uh, you know, stomach bloating and endobelly, as patients call it, but also face and joints and uh, and things like that. I'm sure like every endo patient is like, yep, I know what you're saying. <laughs> but, well, it's, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because we don't talk about it a lot because we talk about the endo belly. I think we we all know the endo belly too, too well and you can't plan for that belly. It just happens and you're like, I was going to go to the beach. Um, but I, one of my first symptoms was two years before my diagnosis and I would get really swollen kneecaps, like visibly retaining water, swollen kneecaps. And I was at a doctor's office and I said, um, I don't know what's going on with me. And he said, well, maybe you have diabetes because you really do have swollen kneecaps. And my mom kept saying to me, I think you're eating too many snacks that are processed, and I'm like, you know, cause the mom thing. Right. And I couldn't figure out no matter, I could drink water and literally just drink water. And not that I'm saying that's the right thing to do, but my point being that no matter what I ate or didn't eat, I would have this reaction of a swollen, swollen legs and swollen kneecaps. And then it all made sense when I, when I got the endo diagnosis that, 
I was having an inflammatory reaction, but I never knew that it could be your joints, your fingers, your knees, your face. It really is an overall, like you said, systematic process that your body goes through with the disease. Absolutely. And I, I would add to what you're saying is, is how it's important for patients to know, to understand their body and to know that it's Sometimes it might be out of their control. It's very hard. I think the burden is so high on patients, right? To say like, what did I do that caused this? Uh, you know, and go back and say like, but I don't understand. I've been eating, eating so well for the past yeah. two weeks and here I have this reaction. And we really, as scientists, don't understand yet these mechanisms. But I think making, you know, communi even communicating the lack of knowledge about this to patients is sometimes helpful because I think we as, as patients um, tend to look for like, you know, what did I do? What did I do wrong? And I should wow. be able to manage myself better. And it's, it's difficult. Um, so, you know, preventing a flare is I think one of, the, one of the things that our patients talk to us constantly in focus groups and, and mostly about the lack of control and, and trying so hard and feeling very distressed by the fact that they can't control it. So even, even some communication about that, you know, I wish I had been told that also, you know, when yeah. I was going through my- well, you come my, at it from such a, a, a very empathetic point of view because you know firsthand and you know how it feels to, to not understand your body, but to be expected to somehow understand what's going on when even the doctors don't necessarily understand what's going on. And, and yeah. there's so much to it. Um, and, and many of us don't have even a diagnosis for 10 plus years. So by the time you get one, you're like, great, I'm, I'm validated, but, but I still don't have all the answers. If someone wants to participate with Citizen Endo, can they and how can they? Yes, so so Citizen Endo is is a kind of our umbrella project. We it's definitely always open for recruiting. The primary way in which you can participate is to download uh, our app, which is called Fendo, P H E N D O, uh, and it's a it's an acronym for phenotyping endometriosis, which basically means characterizing what endo is about for patients. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a free research app available on Android and iTunes. And when you start the app, there's a research consent and it's all done through the app. But when you use the app, uh, you become a, a participant in the study and then you can opt out of the study whenever you want. There's functionality in the app for it. Um, within the app, we then, uh, and the Citizen Endo community, we then uh, have others kind of smaller studies where we reach out to participants and recruit people this way. And so, for example, um, a study we're about to start is we're going to be looking at like um, about 50% of our participants have agreed to have their voice recorded. Uh, and so we're looking into a pilot where we're asking um, patients to kind of record themselves and talk to us for a minute uh, every day or so for like two weeks. Oh, and right. the question we have there is, can we detect automatically, not so much what you say, but changes from one day to another in your voice? And is that a precursor to a flare? So we're trying to really look for like these very new ways, uh, you know, this is a very technological question, but very new ways of capturing uh, or predicting when a flare is about to happen. And not that we can change it for now, but at least we can help people manage their life and cancel a few things in their life if something is That's about to be done. Crazy. So you're thinking it could maybe be like a, a stress-related thing, perhaps, I to pick up stress or? It, it could be, you know, I think definitely, I, I would say for myself, and I think when we hear from patients, definitely stress is not helping, yeah. <laughs> but it's very easy to say, you know, reduce stress. I think we'd love all to reduce stress. I think we're really trying to um, be able to identify, are there any uh, anything in the pitch of your voice or anything in the tone of your voice that changes, um, you know, maybe two or three days before you start having actual symptoms. And these two, three days, if we can validate this, you know, obviously we need a lot of, of research, but the hypothesis is then we can, alert someone and say, you know, it sounds like they're starting to, something is starting to change in your body. 
maybe take it easy or maybe, you know, get ready. <laughs> wow. it um, so yeah. it's very experimental, obviously, but, um, but so we're about to, you know, reach out to, to our participants and see who wants to try this and, you know, yeah. um, be part of the be part of the question and the answer hopefully I want a big thank you to all of those that are participating in the studies and who are helping give more insight into into endo and what goes on but thank you so much today for explaining what you do it's really really cutting edge and awesome and we need more of this so thank you thank you thank you it was nice talking with you diana you do and please come back <laughs> will do